Excuse me, the log. Alright, guys. Well, I think we have escaped the tornado here in the middle of this tornado walk here in Doomsday Trailer here in the middle of the collapse of everything this rainy day in Donellan, Florida Wednesday April 3rd 2024 so I was <clears throat> thinking of doing a, a an update on what the hell is going on down there in Haiti <coughs> But I was just getting ready to do that and uh, finished up with the mainstream media and came over to medium.com and uh, found this article that, uh, that, that, that I can't just let go w w w without comment. Uh, now, it is April 3rd. Sometimes sometimes it takes a couple of days for things to show up on medium so i'm assuming this was an april 1st joke uh this is one of the greatest pieces of doomer satire i have ever read so we are going to assume this was obviously written on uh on april fool's day no, this was not written on April Fool's Day. Uh, this was written on March 25th. Maybe it was released on April Fool's Day. But anyway, uh, this is my two-day late uh, April Fool's story, but it's, it's, the, it's probably the funniest thing I have ever read on Medium. Uh, sorry, Michael, I... Michael Campy has a funny one out there today, but compared to this, Michael, you, you gotta <laughs> gotta get back to it, brother. Uh, this is written either by a master satirist or the biggest clueless fucking moron I might ever have found on Medium. A guy, just a one word one word name, Marco Kenya. Marco Kenya is a San Francisco geek, an entrepreneur, a wannabe economist, a wannabe economist. He wants to be an economist, <clears throat> although he sounds to me like he is one already, and a mediocre equestrian. And so this wannabe economist, Marco Kenya, is going, has a few things to say to doomers obviously uh marco is not a fan not a fan of doomers and collapsitarians so he is going to steer us straight and tell us what is really happening what is really happening with collapse theory it's not what you think you damn doomer Okay, Doomer. All right, take it away, Marco Kenya. We are not headed for societal collapse. We are not approaching the end of days. We are not in a place where it's necessary to plan for apocalyptic conditions berry picking and bunker building. No, this is not in our near future. So why do so many people believe the end is near? The stock markets have hit multiple record highs this week. Unemployment. Unemployment is at a record low. Many other indices are scoring high, including our Human Development Index, whatever the hell that is, health, education, financial mobility, financial mobility, savings, credit scores, and more. 
Nevertheless, our happiness index is disturbingly low, especially considering our economic and cultural good health. There's a malaise in the air. It's not generalized, but rather seems centered around a few fairly large pockets in our society. Blue-collar, high school educated people believe on balance that America is headed in a bad direction. There you go. It is the blue-collar, high school educated people who are falling for uh, all of this bullshit. Some of this is political and will shift if Donald Trump wins in 2024. Okay? Then we have the intellectuals and the light intellectuals. I guess he would probably consider me a light intellectual. The, the intellectuals and the light intellectuals, who he describes as people who are not academics, but interested in social sciences and social justice generally echo a pessimistic sentiment and the belief that the human race is living an unsustainable lie. Ha! Huh. And that soon it will all collapse due to unbridled greed and rampant corruption. These people are the intelligent but unsuccessful demographic. Okay, so if you degree that the human race is living an unsustainable lie and that soon it will all collapse, you're either a blue collar high schooler or you are a light intellectual uh, who is intelligent but unsuccessful. They, meaning people like me, will do less well than their parents. I'm about even. And will struggle with student debt, no student debt here, career stagnation, urban poverty, and a permanent sense of despair and lack of meaning. It's difficult for them to break free of their pessimism because this is what they breathe, read, talk about with their cohorts, and there is not enough optimism in view to grasp and run with. Post-COVID sensitivity, January 6th shock, and the reality of far-right hate groups all conspire to make this demographic feel helpless and hopeless. Their entrenched academic-inspired ideas around social justice and further isolating them from mainstream society, allowing them to believe that they are the enlightened ones, while the rest of the world has its head in the sand, or up its ass, as the case may be. These are two groups of people. There may be more, you know, such as the, uh, the old boomers, uh, clearly, anyway, and there may be more who believe in slightly different ways that society is on the verge of collapse. They make up maybe 15% of America's population. Their belief systems are entrenched. Their lives are largely broken. And they are without a shadow of a doubt disgruntled citizens. Their point of view is legitimate. There you go. I mean, 
they are right, which is another way of saying their point of view is legitimate. They are right, but their grasp on the big picture is limited. Yes, America and its Western allies. The lineup has changed somewhat since World War II, but still the term Western ally, allies describes free countries with healthy economies and freely elected democratic leaders, free markets, and a strong middle class still drive the world's healthiest and happiest economies. They are the countries everyone else <clears throat> wants to immigrate to. They are where cool stuff gets invented. Cool culture, cool culture from, comes from these countries <coughs> and is either banned or secretly adored in the non-free countries that still operate under despot leaders and oppressive regimes. And I am going, now he, what he does is he breaks down these false beliefs. The, the, if anybody believes any of the fo following, you are obviously, according to this clueless fucking moron, a clueless moron, I'm going to switch uh, one and two because this one, he, he put it at number two, but uh, we're going to make it number one. Okay. If you believe this, you're a clueless moron. The belief that we will run out of natural resources is based on our current consumption of resources known or assumed to be finite in quantity. Oil, water, wood, leather, leather, beef, fish, lithium, etc. A simplistic graph would plot human population growth over the coming decades and natural resource usage with an inevitable crossover point where there are, or there is no more water, fish, etc. I think you see this graph, many versions of it, and the limits to growth. That's, that's the graph he's talking about, is the famous uh, limits to growth uh, graph, which obviously this dude uh, it says anybody who believes in that in those little graphs out of limits to growth, you're full of shit. <clears throat> okay, what we fail to consider, you know, when looking at this limits to growth bullshit, what we fail to consider is our impressive resilience and creativity when forced with resource constraints. Our eight billion people and our biggest urban densities would have been inconceivable in 1824. I don't know why I picked that date. We are able to support large, thriving cities in desert locations where without water and shade and air conditioning, humans would be unable to exist. As a resource becomes supply constrained, its price rockets upward and the fabulous balance, the fabulous balance of open markets generate the human creativity that find alternatives and thus evens out the demand with new supply. Okay, so he's not denying, I guess, that without water and shade and air conditioning, 
we probably would not have Phoenix, Arizona, or Dubai, uh, or uh, you know, a lot of those kinds of places, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, I anyway. Uh, but don't worry, we will just find alternatives to water, shade, and air conditioning in, in, uh, in, in Phoenix and Dubai and everywhere else. So what? Yeah, the water and the shade, you know, you know even the, the cactus, those big saguaro cactuses that provide the only shade in Phoenix, even they are toppling over from the heat. So once we lose the water from the Colorado River, we lose the shade from the saguaro cactuses that have shriveled up in the heat, and we lose the air conditioning, which I think is also supplied by the Colorado River. The, the, the wonderful balance of open markets will stimulate human creativity to come up with new alternatives to water, shade, and air conditioning. And Phoenix, Arizona, and Dubai, and the rest of them are going to keep right on humming along. All right, but that was uh, his number two, but his number one one was, and, 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 and on one level, I, I, I don't disagree with the dude that much on this one. The belief that capitalism is broken, well, I, I believe that capitalism is broken, and about to fail, I, I, I think that's two different beliefs. He lumps up capitalism being broken with capitalism about to fail. I would put capitalism is broken and the no shit Sherlock category and the capitalism is about to fail uh, in the ain't gonna happen anytime soon category. All right, but he lumps these together. The belief that capitalism is broken and about to fail is without basis. Cap capitalism requires growth. That is true. Growth involves risk. I think we can all agree that growth involves risk. There are downturns and there are failures. It can be equated to an ecosystem in nature. Life, death, survival of the fittest, regeneration, decay, a huge cyclical system. There is no plausible theory that would convince those who understand capitalism that the ecosystem of capitalism is failing or about to fail. What is happening instead is that those who have failed to make capitalism work for them, those who have failed to make capitalism work for them are wishing for its end. Okay, I have actually done a pretty good job over my life of making capitalism work very well for me. Uh, and, 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 and I could be making it work a hell of a lot better for me. Uh, and so, of course, the day after I die, is when I want capitalism to end. Anyway, confirmation bias allows them, you know, those who have failed to make capitalism work for them. It is your fault. If, if, if capitalism did not work for you, you clueless moron, don't blame capitalism. Blame yourself. Look at that fucking doomer, uh, Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles. Uh, fucking capitalism has worked fine for him. Confirmation bias allows them to imbue isolated failures, i.e. 
corporate bankruptcies, fraud scandals, antitrust lawsuits, etc., as a harbinger of generalized collapse. We listen, we observe, <clears throat> and we see that isolated failures are part of a healthy ecosystem. Isolated failures are part of a healthy ecosystem. Just as a herd of wildebeest may lose some of its weaker animals in a drought. <laughs> Guys, I, I could not uh, be making this up. Well, let's do one more. We're, we're going to do one more. Uh, was this written? I think this might have been written uh, the day before. I think it was on the day before we, that, that container ship smashed into that bridge in Baltimore. The belief that infrastructure will somehow suffer generalized failure is, I think, an extension of groupthink coming from other conversations where people enjoy imagining the end of a system they dislike. With this fantasy comes a daydream of a new dawn in a different type of civilization, perhaps one where all the rich people have been killed and their spoils are shared among the ordinary people. Romantically, romantically, yes, we're imagined to be out picking berries and sowing seeds in rows as we return to our honest, innocent selves. Victor Hugo wrote, Less Miserables. Less Miserables. Uh, well, I guess Less Miserables is a, uh, I think that's supposed to be Fewer Miserables. Uh, there probably will be less or fewer miserables uh, coming up than there are. A anyway, Victor Hugo wrote Less Miserables and other great classics in a time when the industrial barons were running away with the bullion as the miners and factory workers existed under the most atrocious conditions. We're failing to see that in 2024? We are failing to see we are failing to see the uh, you, you, you know the billionaire class running away with the riches in 2024. There you go. We are living through the Firth. This is spelled F-I-R-T-H. We are living through the Firth Industrial Revolution, the Firth Industrial Revolution, and yes, some barons are accumulating vast wealth, while millions are wallowing in their shitty jobs at Walmart and fast food joints. The disillusionment of the less fortunate is easy to understand and sympathize with. That does not mean that the whole system will collapse. It also does not mean we're heading for the French Revolution, USA. The angry and dispossessed people are outnumbered four to one by the thriving groups whose lives have never been better. Okay, the angry and dispossessed people outnumbered four to one by the thriving groups whose lives have never been better. Of the 46.2 million immigrants in the U.S., 55% are working uh, and making more money than ever. So I guess 45% of the 46 million immigrants in the U.S. are unemployed. 
that's about 20 million unemployed immigrants in the U.S., but I do have plenty of $20 an hour work for immigrants at Bugs in a Jar Farm. Of the 5.5 million new businesses founded in the past five years, including Bugs in a Jar Farm <clears throat> vacation rentals, most are still in operation and many are thriving. For every job lost due to layoffs and closures, 1.7 jobs have been opened or created, leading to an overall shortage of human capital across sectors of the economy. Okay. So uh, let's look, I guess, at the, he, he does have to give a little bit of a nod to the Doomers in the far, I, he doesn't put any years on this. <clears throat> Will society collapse one day? Yes, it will. Just ask the Incas, Mayans, Greeks, Romans, etc. Yet, it is inevitable that Western civilization will one day eventually decay and be replaced by another form of societal governance and culture. There you go. Based on past form, this is likely to be an oppressive regime managed by a fearsome ruler. I, I, uh, I think the one day might be National Donut Day, otherwise known as November 5th, 2024, when, uh, when we will be uh, dictated by an oppressive regime managed by a fearsome ruler. Western civilization was a flash in the pan. Yes. When this happens, you know, when this decay being replaced by an oppressive, fearsome ruler does happen, there will probably not be a collapse but rather a transition away from what we know now to a new ecosystem. Can you say the ecosystem of jellyfish? We should ask ourselves how likely it is that this new system would dismantle the technologies and tools of developed, I guess already developed, and return us to a hunter-gatherer species? Or would we exist in a Hunger Games world where the goodies are reserved for the people in power? This is probably not the collapse our disgruntled friends have in mind. So, nope, my disgruntled friends, uh, just uh, get out there and, uh, and think of some alternatives for water, shade, and air conditioning. But anyway, uh, now that I've prefaced that, I use that as a segue. Maybe we can go look at the country of Haiti uh, and see how well what's going on in Haiti today, uh, you know, illustrates what this clueless fucking moron is saying. But I do appreciate the, uh, the laugh and uh, I'm, I'm trying to give that guy some credit that that was his, uh, his April Fool's uh, Doomer Humor essay. Let's throw it on. Bye, guys.